blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering there's pain in the offering blessed be your name and every blessing you pour out i'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in lord still i will say blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glorious name you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Be seated for a moment. My name is Pastor Shane. I'm the Family Ministries Pastor here at Grace. I want to welcome you guys all here this morning. Uh, we have a few different announcements we want to go through, and uh, after that, we'll continue in some singing. Uh, just so you know, uh, if you are new here this morning, we just want to give you a special welcome. We'd love to get to know you. Uh, feel free to go to the foyer. There's a welcome desk there. We'd love to connect with you there, and there's even a welcome gift there for you. As well, uh, back in the uh, foyer area, that is where we do our uh, tithes and offerings or giving. There's a little kiosk over in the corner with a debit machine, or you can give an offering plate there. So thank you for your giving to Grace. Um, this afternoon, uh, actually starting at about noon, uh, we want to invite all of you to come out to our last summer park party. It is at Jensen Park. And uh, so bring your lawn chairs, bring a lunch, and uh, come on out for a time of fellowship and uh, lots of freezies. I even got sugar-free freezies. I don't know why, but last time the kids just had way too many freezies. And uh, I'm just trying to help out you parents, okay? So these are sugar-free freezies this time. We'd love to have you guys come out to Jensen Park. That sounds starts sometime around noon. Uh, as the summer wraps up, we have a, a youth event that's going to be happening. Uh, so it's an end of summer bonfire for our youth. Um, that is going to be here at East Lake Park on the 27th of August at 6 p.m. So it also includes uh, supper. So bring five bucks if that's if that if you forget it, that's okay. Uh, that's fine. Just talk to Connor, and he would love to give you more details on that for our youth. Um, seniors are going to have a, uh, the Young at Heart seniors are going to have a barbecue and movie night at the church next Sunday at 5 o'clock. So you can RSVP for that with Mary Rempel by the 24th if you're able to come. And if you can come, uh, sign up and bring a side dish or a dessert or a salad. So talk to Mary about that. Uh, as well, uh, the fall is uh, coming on. Uh, here in a couple weeks, we have church camp our family camp, so there are still some spots available for family camp. Uh, after family camp, we do have our fall kickoff, and uh, after the fall kickoff, then we will start uh, into two services. Uh, but as we're looking towards the fall, uh, we will be uh, asking people to, to come alongside and, and join us as we uh, kind of run some of our programs, our ministries, whether with our kids 
uh, with our uh, youth and even our young adults. Uh, so we are going to be adding an extra service, especially for our kids, on Sunday morning. So we do need help uh, making sure that that works well. So if you can help out in any of our children's ministries or youth ministries or young adult even, uh, or any other way, feel free to contact me. Contact uh, Dana or Deb or Connor or Wendy or Pastor John or just contact the church. We would love to get to hear from you guys about that. Uh, as well, coming up uh, this fall, I'm a football guy. I know there are some other football guys here in the church. Um, so I want to be able to connect with some guys via fantasy football. I don't know if, I know there's probably a lot of wives that are rolling their eyes right now, but fantasy football is a real legit way that guys can connect together. So uh, we want to have a, a fantasy football pool here at the church. Uh, space is limited, so I would love for you to talk with me about that. We're going to have a, a draft party at my house on the 7th of September. So if that is something that interests you, just uh, come and find me and I'd love to chat with you a little bit about that. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to continue singing here now. Would you stand with me as we continue? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the day you've given us. Thanks so we can come to your house uh, as your people, uh, collectively to worship, honor, and glorify you. Lord, as we come to your church, we're here this morning uh, for you to do a work in us. This is about you, Lord, and what you seek to do in us. So, Father, we invite your presence with us this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, for our ability to meet. Thank you for the work that's going on at Whispering Pines Bible Camp. We ask that you would continue to strengthen them as they uh, wrap up the summer. We want to thank you for the work that uh, you've been doing uh, even in our seniors and as they've been connecting this summer. We want to thank you for opportunities for our youth to get together. As we start looking towards the fall, Lord, we anticipate that you'll continue to equip us as your church to do the work you've called us to. And as we uh, now uh, turn our, our collective and our focus towards uh, even just singing and hearing your word brought to us from Pastor John, Father, may you be moving in our midst. May we uh, hear from you this morning and understand, Lord, that you truly are our king and we are your children. So we praise you this morning. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul holy name sing like never before oh my soul I worship your holy name you're rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul Draw 
is near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. Lord, I'll worship your holy name. Our God is a consuming fire, burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the only righteous judge, ruling and wisdom we will keep our eyes on you we will keep our eyes on you a mighty fortress is our God a sacred refuge is your name your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign. Let's go back to verse 1. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. judge ruling over us with kindness and wisdom we will keep our eyes on you we will keep our eyes on you a mighty fortress is our God the sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. With you forever we will reign. Our God is jealous for his own. None could comprehend his love and his mercy. Our God is exalted on his throne, high above the heavens, forever he is worthy. Fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign. A mighty fortress is our God. A sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. With you forever we will reign. We will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our eyes on you. 
so we can set our hearts on you. We will set our hearts on you. The mighty fortress is our God. The sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. With you forever we will reign. With you forever we will reign. With you forever we will reign. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon. Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. We thank you that we, your people, can praise and worship you, the only one worthy of our praise and worship. And now, Lord, as Pastor John comes up to bring us your word, may you open our ears, our hearts, our eyes to your word so that we might be transformed by it this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Can be seated. Well, good morning, Grace, and uh, to those who are watching online here this morning, it's uh, good to see you out. Uh, another warm day that we're going to be experiencing. Uh, looking forward to the park picnic that uh, we'll be doing our last one of the summer here today. Uh, last time we did the park picnic, I might be the one to blame with the freezies. I took over the freezy, uh, uh, giving them to the kids, and they just kind of kept coming to me, and so I kept handing them out to them. So, so maybe that's why we're going to sugar-free uh, freezies uh, today. So. But uh, anyways, we had a great time, and uh, you know, uh, last night I was able to uh, be uh, at my wife's uh, work, uh, kind of a wrap-up for their project work party, and, and I, I always think, you know, when I go to these parties, uh, in terms of, you know, how can God maybe use me, or, you know, because without, uh, without contact, you'll never have any impact, and so how do we, uh, how do we connect with the, those in the community? But when everybody, when, whenever somebody asks me, what do you do for a living? And then I say, I am a pastor. It is interesting the different responses you will get from people and how they react to you. Well, this, this uh, one guy there last night, he uh, asked me what I did. And so I said, I am a pastor. And, and uh, it, you know, he, he didn't, his jaw didn't drop or anything like that. But... Uh, but then he went on to ask me, uh, well, what am I going to be uh, preaching on tomorrow? So, so I was able to share my message with uh, this guy uh, last night and kind of gave him my three-point sermon. Uh, obviously, I didn't take a half hour or so to uh, <laughs> talk to him. He might have drifted off. But, but I, I was able to kind of summarize a little bit about what I want to talk about. And, and what I do want to talk about is worry, uh, stress. And, uh, and he could identify, you know, with us. I think all of us can identify with worry, with stress in our lives, probably even today. Um, all of us today probably will have some anxious moment, some, something that we might be, uh, you know, worrying about. And so how do we deal with these type of things? In your bulletins, there's an outline to uh, follow with th today's message. But, you know, living in the 21st century... You know, it's filled with many things to worry about. 
There are economic fears, you know, rising inflation right now, which has taken over, you know, the number one worry of uh, the COVID pandemic here. But we worry about our finances, economics, finance, you know, finances, you know, can we make it, our housing costs, our mortgage rates, job security, retirement, sustainability, how will I survive in my retirement if the stocks and things like that continue to go down? There are also health fears, there cancer, COVID, cardiac arrests. You know, I think maybe we should stop naming our diseases after the letter C. But there's a lot of health concerns that we will deal with in our lifetime. And how do we, you know, handle those type of things? There are climate fears that uh, even on the news this morning as I was listening to the radio, climate fear is what they're talking about. Global warming, lack of water. Years ago, it was acid rain. I, I'm not sure I haven't heard acid rain for a long time. So I guess we're done with that worry. But, um, you know, there's floods, there's fires, there's droughts, there's famines, there's a uh, shortage of food supplies. How will we make it? And people are worrying about these type of things. And then we all probably deal with relational uh, stresses, relational fears. You know, maybe rejection. Will they accept me? Or, you know, we might fear divorce or we fear the death of a loved one. And then there's societal fears. Overpopulation, crime, corruption, wars that happen throughout the world and how they affect us. You see, all these fears and more, probably a thousand more, have turned us into a worry-wart society. I think everyone has a fear story. You know, and every fear story is usually tied to the loss of some temporal possession. You know, what maybe fear story overwhelmed you as a child, or maybe even today? You know, things that bring worry into your life. When my uh, wife was in high school, the teacher told the class that the world would run out of water in 30 years. Well, this freaked out my wife and, you know, the rest of the class. Well, it's been over 30 years now. We still have water in our world. But I think, you know, the world, it, it was, you know, fear-mongering. And it created unnecessary anxiety in the lives of that class. It, it's hard not to be anxious. Like I said, today you're probably going to experience some sort of anxiety or in the next few days. It might be minor, it might be more major, but you will face some sort of worry in your life. And yet God never meant for you to be crushed under the weight of care. No, you were never meant to be overwhelmed with worry and anxiety. Chronic worry it can lead to psychological and phys physiological changes in a person's life. Uh, Billy Graham, uh, he once wrote, physicians tell us that 70% of all illnesses are the cause being behind them mental distress or worry. It has been listed by heart specialists as the number one cause of heart trouble. Psychiatrists tell us that worry breeds nervous breakdowns and mental disorders. Worry is more adept than father time in etching deep lines in faces. It is disastrous to health, robs life of its zest, crowds out constructive creative thinking, and cripples the soul. And so how do you handle worry? How do you handle anxiety in your life? You know, some people will try to solve it by sleeping it off, drinking it away or by indulging in food, shopping, or maybe watching TV. Some people hope that maybe a weekend away or, you know, a, a, an extended vacation will solve their problems of worry, of anxiety. And though some, uh, although some of these approaches might give you, you know, a temporary breather from your worries, they will not eliminate them altogether. And so as I continue in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34, uh, if you have your Bibles today, you can turn there. It will be on the screen or in the bulletin here as well. But Jesus addresses the topic of worry. 
and how to handle it, how to eliminate it in your life. And so this morning, uh, we're, we're going to read this responsibly actually this morning. So I'm going to ask you as a congregation, we haven't read the scripture responsibly for a while, so I'm going to read the first part and then the next slide will mention congregation. And so if you can read that out loud as a congregation. So, so let us stand as we uh, read God's word here this morning. And so I, I will begin here, Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the fields grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Let's remain standing for prayer. Father, uh, today we uh, thank you for your word. We thank you for the Sermon on the Mount that uh, Jesus had given to his disciples and those who are listening in. And Lord, today we still have this sermon that we can reflect upon. Lord, to, to uh, listen to the words that you have given to us. And so we pray your blessing upon your word today. Use it to, to um, challenge us further in our faith with you. And Lord, to encourage us as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat uh, at this time. So the passage starts out with the word, therefore. Therefore. And it ties uh, to the preceding scripture that I talked about last week in which, uh, you know, on how we were to deal with earthly treasures. You see, a wrong approach on possessions in life can result in unnecessary anxiety in life. The word uh, life in is translated from the Greek word psyche. And so, you know, psyche, we get uh, psychology, psychiatry. And uh, when you worry about the things of life, about your psyche, it, you know, it affects your psyche, your mental health, your inner soul, your spirit. You see, no longer is your mind at rest. You are constantly in a state of anxiety. Worry can also affect the decision-making process. You know, and you may end up doing things that will complicate things even further because you're, you're operating out of a state of anxiety and fear and suddenly you make decisions that maybe are not the best decisions to make. Jesus says, trust your Heavenly Father so that you can be at rest mentally. You know, prolonged worry, it can lead to uh, clinical depression. In the previous passage, the, Jesus, uh, the, the people heard Jesus say, you know, kind of choose. Do you want to serve money or do you want to serve God? And so the people who heard Jesus say this, they might well have asked, if we choose to serve God rather than money, what will happen to us? You know, if we no longer are zealous to earn money, won't our basic materials uh, needs go unmet? And so there's anxiety when we think we have to control it all. We have to do it all. Jesus' answer, in effect, was don't worry about it. God will take care of you. You know, if a person serves God, then they 
have no need to worry about not having enough. God who gives life will sustain life. If he gives life, he's going to sustain that life. And so in this passage, Jesus repeats three times the phrase, do not worry. It's something that he's wanting us to really understand. And so when life overwhelms you, remember this command. You know, it's not a suggestion. It's, it's a, not a recommendation. It's actually a command. Do not worry. Follow through on what Jesus says in this passage, and you will begin to handle worry in a lot better way. And so one of the things in, in verses 25 to 30 is simply remember your value. You know, do not worry. Are you not much more valuable than they? Human uh, beings are the crowning achievement of God's creation. You who are sitting here today, you who are watching our, online, are the crowning achievement of God's creation. The psalmist asked the question in Psalm 8 verse 4, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You know, it is because they are considered of the highest value of the earthly creation. And in the next verse, verses, the psalmist writes, You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. God has created you with value. You know, the fact that you have life, that you have been given life in this world, it shows that you are an integral part of God's creation. You know, I'm always uh, thankful for, you know, being born. I I'm thankful for earthly life. You know, I I'm thankful for, you know, my salvation and all that. But I'm always thankful for the life that has been given to me in this world. Because if I was never created, I would never know God and I would never experience heaven one day. And so I am glad that I was born, that I am able to experience God. You see, God, because you sit here today, you are important. You are an integral part of God's creation. What God creates, He considers valuable, and you are of highest value. And so it's not food, it's not clothing that attaches value to your life. Without life, if you didn't have life, you wouldn't need the clothes that you have, you wouldn't need the food that you eat. See, the point is that if God provides you with life, will He not give you the things necessary to support that life, such as food and clothing? In this passage, Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater. You know, if God takes care of the lesser, how much more will He take care of the greater? And so He gives two illustrations to show the value of your life. The birds of the air, the, the flowers of the field. The birds of the air, Jesus, who is teaching on the hillside, likely sees some birds that fly by. And this sparks an illustration, an analogy that He can use. And so he tells the disciples, look at those birds, maybe that just flew by, and how they do not worry about their daily provision. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store away in a barn for the next day. They are provided for by the Heavenly Father. And so he says, if the birds do not worry, why should you worry? There's a poem by an author that said uh, that says, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. You see, Jesus, all creation is under God's care. Jesus is not advocating a lazy ethic in this passage here. You know, it's been said that no creature works harder than the average sparrow uh, to make a living. You know, birds are flying here and there, and they're always looking for food and collecting things. 
but they hunt with the assurance that food will be found. They hunt because God will provide for them. You know, God, when you read the Old Testament, He provided the manna, the quail for the Israelites. But it didn't mean they just had to sit and wait for it. They still had to go out and find it. They had to gather it. And so you are to work alongside God in your daily provision of needs. What Jesus does prohibit, though, is worry, not work. You see, as you work, God provides. Again, if you took the attitude that uh, you will not even try to work, then you might have a reason to be anxious that I won't have any food, I won't have any you know, things to do, or, or you know, clothing. And so food, water, and clothing do not simply just show up in your plate. God has given us a body to do things, but He does have that available for us. And then he looks at the flowers of the field. You know, Jesus looked around again on the hillside, and as he looked down, maybe this time he saw some lilies and flowers. And again, that sparked an illustration. The field lilies, flowers and grass, you know, they didn't last long because of the heat, the dryness, maybe the scorching sun in that type of uh, climate. But as short-lived as these lilies were, God considers them valuable. And he arrays them with a beauty that shone, oh, shone, even Solomon's wardrobe, the richest man in the world at his time. You see, the point is that if God considers flowers that important, how much more does he not consider the needs of your life? You know, will he not provide you clothing that you need or shelter to provide you with? Again, the whole argument of Jesus is that you are valuable and that is something for us to remember that when maybe somebody tries to put you down or you feel rejected remember that God values you above anything else and so the Heavenly Father will make sure that you will receive the necessities of life you don't have to worry if God provides so greatly for the lesser things of creation, the birds and flowers of the field, you know, will He not provide even better for the highest parts of His creation, humanity that's been created in His image? And so if God gave you life, then He will provide for that life. But it comes down to who you put your trust in and what you seek as a priority. Again, what are you chasing after? In the last passage, Jesus said, you know, are you trying to store up earthly possessions or are you storing up heavenly possessions? He's saying that the, the pagans are running after all these things, but what are they seeking? What are they, you know, worry is driving them to do things that is not good for their health. And so in verses 31 to 33, Jesus says, seek God first. Do not worry. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. When you understand how much God values you, you then begin to trust Him with your life and what is necessary to it. You know, a God-focused life will lead to a worry-free life. No longer are you possession-driven to serve yourself. You are God-driven to serve Him. And, and, you know, the amazing thing is that God will provide for you. He will take care of you. But many people, and you've probably encountered maybe in your workplaces and that, and even ourselves, we live in a frenzied, worried world because people have not made God their priority. You know, His kingdom and His righteousness, their number one priority. Jesus says, you know, the, the non-Christians, the people that don't know God, they will chase after all these types of things, hoping that this will bring them assurance. And yet they have no assurance because they are doing it on their own. They have no one to back them up. You see, God is removed from their lives and they do have reason to worry. They don't know Him as Father. In the next chapter uh, 7, which I will be going into in the fall here to finish off the Sermon on the Mount, but Jesus reminds His disciples about the Father's goodness. 
You know, if you know God in your life as Father, He is good. And in verse 11 of chapter 7, He says, How much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? You know, a good and loving Father will make sure that His child receives the basics of life and more. You know, I provide my kids not just food and clothing. I give them a few other things as well when they were growing up. And so Jesus is saying, how much more will your, you know, your perfect Father, he who has all resources at His disposal, you know, that He will provide you not only food and clothing and the basic necessities of life, but He will bless you beyond even that. Sometimes we can miss out on God's blessings because we fail to make His kingdom and His righteousness the first priority in life. You see, first things first, and the rest will follow. There's a, there, there was a father who had a son who was going to college, and, and the son was writing an exam and wondered if his dad would buy him a car. I, I don't know what son thinks that, that he's, if I write an exam, his dad might give him a car. But this son thought, well, if I write this exam and if I pass, uh, maybe my dad will give me a car. And, and, and so he goes to his dad, he says, uh, you know, would you do this for me? Well, I will have to think about that, the father replied. While the son wrote his exam, and to his joy he passed. Dad, dad, I passed the exam, shouted the excited son. Great, the father exclaimed. We will see what we can give you. Well, the father wanted his son to know God first in his life. And so three days later, the dad came to his son and gave him a Bible. A Bible, said the upset son. You said you might give me a car. And at that, threw the Bible at the feet of his father. He left home and never returned. Well, some time passed and the father became so ill, so ill that he passed away. The son came home for the funeral and walked into his father's office saw on the desk the Bible that was given to him. He decided to pick up the Bible and instinctively started flipping through the pages, and suddenly something caught the attention of his eyes. There in the pages of the Bible was an envelope, and curiously he opened the envelope, and to his shock, here were the keys to a brand new car. See, God's not out to harm you. He will give you what is best, and even more. No, you might not receive a car, but God does bless you with more than the basics of life when you seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. You know, Matthew 6.33 is perhaps the climax, climax to this passage and quite possibly to the whole Sermon on the Mount. You see, if you want to find the antidote to, for worry, you will likely find it in this verse. When you completely surrender your life to trust God and seek Him, worry will become secondary. It will begin to disappear. You know, as one author notes, trust and worry do not dwell together. If we trust, we do not worry. If we worry, we do not trust. And so when worry gets the, the eviction orders from your life, who becomes your new tenant? You know, is it trust in God as that new tenant? Psalm 9 verse 10 notes, Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. You see, your trust in God will put your heart at rest. So remember that you are valuable, and then seek God first. And then finally in verse four, uh, 34, Jesus says, Live life today do not worry about uh, do not worry tomorrow will worry about itself you know earlier in in this sermon jesus had told his disciples to pray that god would give them today their daily bread you know the focus was on today not tomorrow and before that jesus said your father knows what you need before you ask him see life is a test 
It's a test of trusting the Father's care and provision for your life. Again, we're all going to face anxieties in our life, but it's how we handle them. It's where we go with them. Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 6-7, he said, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And Peter wrote in his letter, 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast all your anxiety on Him, for He cares for you. You know, you can lose a lot of sleep when you worry about the things of tomorrow. You know, the what-if scenarios of tomorrow, they rob you of the what-is joys of today. I think we have a lot of what-ifs. What if this happens? What if, you know... And it begins to rob us of the joys that we are to experience today. And so Jesus ends by saying, live your life today. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow may never come. You know, when you worry about tomorrow's cares, you add to today's load. Someone once said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its trials, it simply empties today of its joy. There's a story about a man who raised chickens. And among them was a rooster that occasionally crowed and greatly annoyed the next door neighbor. Well, early one morning, disturbed and angry, the neighbor called the owner and made this complaint. That miserable bird of yours keeps me up all night. I don't understand, was the reply. He hardly ever crows. But if he does, it's never more than two or three times a day. The man quickly retorted, well, that isn't my problem. It's not how often he does it that irritates me. It's not knowing when he might that keeps me awake. (laughs) The what mights, the what ifs, they can keep you awake. You know, enjoy life today rather than fretting when that rooster will crow next. You know, the rooster might die in the night. And you will still be awake all night, a bundle of nerves waiting for that rooster to crow next. You see, the things you worry about tomorrow, they may never come. Live one day at a time. You know, why zap today's joys by worrying about tomorrow's problems? Tackle the day at hand. You know, each day will have enough problems. And some days will have more problems. But every day probably will encounter some sort of problem. And so when you worry about tomorrow, you may miss out on the answers and opportunities of today. As I close here this morning, Jesus is not in this passage advocating a let things fall where they may or a couldn't care less attitude to life. You know, this type of approach to uh, life would create a very maybe grave future for our children. There is a place to make plans, you know, today to mitigate problems in the future. Even the Proverbs, you know, talk about that, about making plans for what we can forecast is coming, where it says, look to the ant that stores up food today, you know, so that it will survive the winter that is coming. There, There is a place for healthy concern. Uh, every day there, there's going to be some sort of concerns that come into our life. But there is a place for healthy concern. A uh, Jeff Treasure notes, we are to cultivate a responsible attitude toward our individual and family needs. But responsibility and concern aren't to be confused with anxiety. Concern, you know, leads to action where worry just frets. Someone said worry is like sitting in a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but you will go nowhere. That's kind of worry. Concern should lead you to action. Worry will just sit and fret about it and make things worse in your own life. You see, concern really should drive you to God in prayer. Trusting Him to guide you. And then working alongside Him to solve the problems of today and and, and tomorrow. But to constantly worry about something that may never come or you have no control over, 
will only complicate matters and negatively impact your health. And so early in the, er, earlier in the passage, Jesus asked the question, you know, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The obvious answer, no. Worry does not extend your life. You know, in fact, it may even shorten your life as constant stress creates personal and health problems. And so live life, enjoy the things that God gives you today. And let God take care of your worries today and tomorrow. There's a lot of great things that God will give you today. And so as I end, there's a, a prayer. It's called the serenity prayer. But it says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. You know, be responsible. Do what you can do today. But don't worry about the things that are beyond your limits. God will take care of that. And He will meet your needs. And so let me pray as we close, as uh, Pastor Shane comes up to lead us in a final song. Father, today, each one of us might uh, struggle with um, anxiety in our lives. Uh, some might be chronic anxiety where we've been living with uh, these type of things for years and it, it is affecting us in different ways. Lord, today, we name our worry, we name our anxieties, and we give them to you. Lord, to cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. And so I pray that uh, in this day that we have, we may encounter some problems. We might encounter worry or anxiety. But Lord, that you would help us through these things. Help us to remember the value that we are to you. Cause us to seek you first. And Lord, let us live this day in honor of you and the things that you so graciously give us. And so I pray your blessing upon each one here today, their families, uh, for those who are watching online. Lord, that you would guide us as we live righteously for you, as we seek your face and call upon your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me for our closing song? Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And I believe. Jesus Christ 
is Lord. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Blessings on you. Have a wonderful week.